join me for an adventure in plein air painting on your brush with nature. Hello everybody. Good to be with you again. As you know, my name is Heiner Hertling and I'm the host of our television show, Your Brush with Nature. Uh, today we're gonna try something different. We are live, which means you'll see all kinds of glitches and mistakes, and, but this is a trial run and I think I enjoy the live part as much as we did the television show, which by the way was on Netflix and it's still playing on Amazon Prime right now. So, as we all know, this is a weird time a weird year. With that COVID going on, it changes everything. It even changed, you know, the hairstyle. I'm going to let it go just for the fun of it. I never did that before, but it brings me to the question, why does hair grow like crazy on the neck and over the ears and not on top of my head? <laughs> but hey, back to why we're here. We are in Jeremy's studio and we put some paintings up Hopefully one day in these live shows we can show you clips of my studio in Heartland. But this should work just fine. It's going to be a, a painting show or a, a show about painting that I would like to start from the very beginning, drawing. And we're going to do like three different sessions of this live show. So we have all the time in the world. And let me give you a little bit of history. Every time I show this to people, they find it really interesting. So maybe you will too. And with not that many things to do being quarantined at home, this is a good time. Uh, if I can help you just a little bit, how to start if you're thinking, I never really painted before, I never had the time, now is, and, but you would always have liked to, do, to learn to draw and paint. This is the time to do it and I'm, I'm going to tell you everything I know. So, um, I came from Germany in 1965. I was born in Hamburg, which is a, no a town in, in the north of Germany. And after school I signed up for an apprenticeship in a graphic studio. Now in Germany it's a little bit tighter than it is here now. Uh, about controlling what companies do who take on a three-year apprentice, apprentice. What the unions and the government doesn't want to happen is that the employer uses <laughs> for very little money uh, uh, a kid that makes that gets donuts and washes their car and stuff. They want you to sign to be educated in whatever field you choose. In my case, it was. Uh, retouching and illustration and graphic design. So what they make you do is keep a log for three years of, I have it here, and this thing is 60 years old and it's falling apart. I, know I should have taken much better care of it. But it's, uh, let me show you. This was the cover and it fell apart. I built it years ago. And that was the back cover. And then it, it is my name and what I'm learning and the, my, the company who hired me. And then, believe it or not, every day, every week, this says, and it's all in German, so you don't really need to read it. I'm explaining it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I had to put in every day what I did that day and where my education was going. Then, which the, was the worst part, on the weekend I had to do, on the back of that week's page, I had to do a drawing at home that kind of explained what I learned that week. And believe it or not, and I don't, it's so faint, but maybe you can see it, it's just kind of ellipses of a little lid to something. But I would write a short explanation, then my boss would correct it or do his comments, and then my dad had to sign it, my boss signed it, and I signed it. Look, isn't that cute? Can you see that, how I wrote? I was, this was 19, well, 1957, 
so I was 17 years old. So for three years, every week had to be documented like this. After a year and a half, they would check it and see if they used, you know, taught me something. And then after three years, I would get my certificate. And see, this was pencil shading. Then we got into perspective with the vanishing points. Then we did ellipses, how a circle turns into, a lip, into an ellipse. And I won't bore you much longer with this, but then I had to learn to do stuff in black and white. Then we added one gray tone in black and white. And then we finally got all the grays. And then I could do a full blended soft edges rendering. So let me flip way to the back. There's looser watercolors. There's tight illustration of subjects. There's my airbrush, which I, by the way, I did with a br did this with a brush. I don't know, my hand must have been really, really steady. For retouching, I learned how to opaque out a negative, and then you have a white background once you develop it again. Anyhow, very interesting little way of teaching a young guy a craft. And believe me, I'm still thankful to the very day that often with a bunch of tears and stuff, they made me do this stuff. But when I was done, I wish my boss would be still alive. I would really thank him again and again. So the, about, I said drawing was, you know, the most important part when you want to learn to paint. You have to be able to draw first. What would you paint if, if you have a bad drawing? You can spend two weeks painting on it and it's gonna be a painting with a bad drawing in full color. <laughs> so what I would recommend and what I had to do for an example is, let me put this down. I try to preserve, preserve this book so young people can maybe look at it one day and say, hey, what my boss would do is he would set an object in front of me every, you know, every day. Something real simple, for example, this coffee cup. And he said, draw it. If I draw it, I have to learn proportions. How tall is that yellow? Is the white as thin as the black raised part, or you constantly have to compare sizes and dimensions. Now, if, if I would have come up to him and I would say, you know, this is the cup, he would immediately go, do it again and make sure it's not too narrow there. It's a lot wider. The angle of the cup, you know, it's not straight. I mean, he would just make me do it over and over and over and constantly correct me. Now this looks a little bit more like, I'm just talking about proportions. So learning to draw, you can throw on your, on your uh, table in front of you anything, a key, uh, well, even like a, a cell phone, if you, now we're getting into perspective a little bit, but you have to be able to draw this stuff. And drawing to me is all comparing distances and sizes. You know, this, this kind of looks right. Maybe it's a little bit too wide. One way we did it in, in those days was with an outstretched arm and your right thumb, 
and the end of the pencil. Let's do it this way. You can go and measure. I'm measuring from here to the bottom of the yellow. Okay, and then you can transfer that to your, you know, to your drawing. Okay, now you get the height of the yellow. Then you can, same head position, same stretched arm. You can do the top of the yellow cup like this. And that goes from, from there to there. So at least it gives you dimensions. But once you get pretty good at it, you don't need to do that anymore. You, you just kind of feel the, the angles and the shapes. So he would put all this stuff in front of me, and then he would do another funny thing. He would say, I got to teach you how to see. And I thought, I can see fine. In those days, I certainly didn't have glasses. That all happens when you turn 40 which, by the way, is half <laughs> of what I'm going to be. <laughs> uh, he said to me, i got to teach you how to see it. The way I'm going to do it is by, for an example, asking you the house you live in. Every day you come from home from work, and every morning you leave there, you turn the door handle. What does the door handle look like? Draw it for me. I had no idea, but I tell you what, I came home that night and I looked at the darn door handle. And then when he said the next day, the fork you eat with, probably the same silverware, can you draw that fork from your memory? So I started looking at the darn door handle and the fork. Well, by the time after three years and him doing that constantly to me, I paid so much more attention to what I see, not just glance by it. And you know, there's a parallel, by the way, from painting now and teaching classes. I had students in, in North Carolina that would come to class in the morning and they were late. And they said, I'm sorry, I drove right by here because I was for the first time looking at the far horizon and how it was soft edged and blurred out. I never saw that before. So I was looking at all that stuff, even though it's on my way that I take every day, and I never saw it till I took your class and you told us about learning to see. So it enriched my life, and it will enrich your life, I tell you that. You see things that you normally would have just bypassed. My kids, when they were little, I have four daughters, would say, I love to go on vacations with Dad because you see so many things. You know, you point out a poodle in the clouds or Mickey Mouse, or you see things that normally you don't pay attention to. Well, like anything else, it's my profession, so I don't blame you if you haven't paid that much attention. I probably am not that critical with music like a musician would be. Same thing. You learn how to hear the musicians know their, you know, hearing so much better and I know my eyes so much better. So uh, once the drawing gets a little bit more secure, you get into we haven't even begun to touch how much complexity there is when you think about perspective, for example, where you have the horizon line. And let me do it on a clean sheet. Frugal, I'm using the back side, that's the German in me. Don't use a new piece of paper. If you have the horizon line, which is your eye level when you look at straight out. And there's a, a cube sitting there, a box, or a table, let's say a table. There's one, these lines go to that one, and these lines 
go to a vanishing point there. And that's what your tabletop should look like. This is called two-point perspective. If you do a skyscraper, then there's another point up there that everything goes to, and you, you know, that's three-point perspective. Again, we won't have the time, and I don't have, I have somewhat knowledge of it, but there's books on perspective, and that gets pretty technical, and you should really spend the time studying perspective and how they figured it out way back, how to make things look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface, and perspective is that way. In my early art classes in elementary school, it was always like the art teacher would say, okay, there's a, here's the horizon again. There's a railroad track and it's coming at you, you know. And there's telephone poles next to it. And they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But that's how we, you know, got, uh, the explanation how the perspective works. Some beginners railroad track, it's like that. Well, that's fine. It doesn't go into the painting. This, this way it will. And once you point out, look back there, way back there. How close are those rails together compared to where you're standing? And then they go, oh, Again, it's all in learning to see. Uh, just quickly, one more thing, ellipsis. It's my pet peeve. Oh, I can see a painting is still life that some artist did, and it's beautiful composition, beautiful color, beautiful everything, but the ellipses are wrong. And ellipses, what I mean by ellipsis is what happens to a circle when you don't look straight onto it. You know, this, this would be the straight on circle. Then if you, for an example like this, then you move it up a little higher and it turns into kind of like an ellipse. And then the higher you come to your eye level, the narrower it gets till it's finally just a line. Now you would look underneath and it would open up again a little bit. You know, this is the... So pay attention to ellipses, but like I said, when I see a painting and there's a coffee cup that is... where the ellipses are, are that wrong? Open on top, not open enough on the bottom. It ruins the whole thing for me. When I came to the United States and I started working in advertising, and we did a lot of automotive stuff, certainly in Detroit. Man, you don't do automotive illustrations or anything if the ellipse, if the tires aren't round, or the wheels are not perfect ellipses, or the headlights are not perfect circles. So, and don't get discouraged if it takes a while. I mean. Often I get this comment from people, oh, you're so talented. Well, I agree, okay. From little on, I was drawn to visual uh, expression of visual things. And even though I was like four years old, my mom would sit, give me a crayon or something, and she said, you would disappear for a half hour, not saying a peep, just drawing. So I give that much to what's called talent. To me, it means the love of doing something over and over again because you like it so much. Otherwise, talent doesn't mean I was born and the good Lord went, Zap, you're a terrific artist. Oh my God, years and years of learning. The little kid that loves to play basketball and is out in the driveway shooting hoops from, you know, every free minute he has because he loves it so much. 
he's going to be pretty good after a few years when he grows up. Now his brother, who was really not interested in basketball, you know, would say, oh, he is my brother, so talented in, in athletics or in playing basketball. No, the kid just loved it and did it over and over. And that's how you learned, by doing it over and over and over. Now as a pretty established, and if I say so myself, pretty darn good artist, I still go out every Saturday or every time we paint outdoors, which is called plein air painting. I don't know that day if I do something nice or if it's going to be a wipeout, which we call it wipeouts. So that's kind of the fun part of it, that it doesn't become a boring, perfect routine every time you do it. And yeah, it's a lot of parallels. You can say the same for golf. You never know that day how, if you can putt or not. Or So just keep it interesting. Besides, I don't want to be completely lopsided and just spend every free minute doing the same thing like painting. I built my own frames, for example. Here's a good example. I didn't build that one. <laughs> When we get to my studio, I'll show you a clip from my studio. Then I can show you the frames I build, which are often rustic driftwood type things for wildlife paintings. And here I'm drifting again. Wildlife, as I just said, is one of my favorites to paint. I always love nature. And so besides loving paintings and, you know, and wildlife or animals, Jeremy is zeroing in right now on this painting I just finished last week of the horses in the morning light, which my daughter called Easy Like Sunday Morning. We all know that song. That's a great title for this morning light coming in. and It's so peaceful. Now what happened was I picked up my grandkids and take to take them to work who are all 16 and 17 and years old. Uh, they live on a horse farm with their dad. And I picked them up and drove out and stopped when I saw this to my left. Grabbed my phone, which is a cool thing to do now with everybody carrying a fairly nice camera in your iPhone clicked a few shots, took them to work, went back home to my studio, put it on my monitor. I have a nice size monitor in my studio and emailed it to myself and then put it up on the monitor and I looked at it and I said, there's a perfect painting right there. I just moved some things to make the composition better. I per, per, uh, on, on purpose uh, used the vertical format because the misty trees in the morning light was kind of what really drew me to it. And the horses I had good reference so I can I can draw animals pretty well. The tough part and here's another thing that people often don't don't understand. The hard part was all the green in the front. There's really nothing there to paint. And you can't just make it a green carpet. There's so many different colors and greens in there and the soft edges and every once in a while a little grass texture and then the sun hitting it. Yeah, it just it was just great fun. So again, back to where you learn how to see. And you learn to see things that in your mind go right away. Oh, that might be a painting. That is a painting. When, if you would see the, the actual shot of the, that I took with my iPhone, uh, it's not at all as moody as my painting. See? See if you can... This was kind of... Oops, there we go. 
So I, I certainly moved things around and emphasized the misty fog. That's the good part about it as an artist. For a long time, the artists had the benefit over photographers of if there was something in your uh, shot, as an artist, you could leave it out if you didn't want something that was not, uh, not, not pretty. Well, with everything being digital now, photographers, photographers can take out things, change color, add things, move things. That was our privilege as an artist compared to a photographer. Now that's, I don't know, there might be some purists left that take a, a, a photograph and not manipulate it. All this new technology certainly helps me too as an artist. You know, having been in commercial art for 40 years, we did things the hard way because there was no other way to do it. Now with all this technology and all the digital stuff, God, what took me days to do can be done in five minutes, like changing the color on a car. We would chemically bleach out the blue and then with dyes add the red back on. Now you just click, pick a color, hit it, and the car is a different color. Well, good. I retired from doing commercial art in the late 80s, early 90s, because the computers came in and my studio all of a sudden, the blinds were closed and you looked at a TV screen. I decided I'm not going to look all day at a, at a rectangle and then go home at night and watch TV on a rectangle. So no more brushes, no more magic markers, no more. So I jumped right back into the fine art, which, by the way, I kept up all my commercial art life, too. I would, on weekends, I would paint. I would go to art shows. I would compete in art competitions. A lot of my colleagues who were commercial artists didn't do that. And I'm glad I did because that f my whole life now is, is fine art and wonderful camaraderies with great artists. And anyhow, can we take a little break for a minute? My mouth is getting dry. Okay, here we are again. Uh, One more thing about that book I showed you for my the three three years of recording every day of my apprenticeship. I might as well brag, but I get a pretty darn good uh, uh, report after three years and got my certificate, which in Germany meant now I was a retoucher. A, certified photo retoucher, which has a certain amount of salary automatically. A photo retoucher who graduated cannot make less than whatever it was in Deutschmarks then. So I could go anywhere in, in Deutschland, in Germany, to and find a job and had a guaranteed salary. Very cool. Talk about, about books. When we started filming Your Brush with Nature, I liked the name, so very soon I wrote a little tabletop type of painting guide for people, and it, you might have seen it. It's called Your Brush with Nature. And look at the cover. All these little objects I was talking about did I learn to draw. A tube of paint, my glasses, a, a cup, a magnifying glass, nice ellipses, some decoys, some wildlife mounds, part of a picture frame, anything. Draw every day till you feel real comfortable at it. What this little book does is basically goes through what I just did for the last 30 minutes, never shutting up. 
I combined some watercolors in here. Uh, art materials, what I take with me when we go painting outdoors. Uh, different formats, horizontal, square, or vertical. Just, a, and then paint by number, basically. When we do more episodes like this, I will certainly get into how I break down a landscape or, or a painting. Today we're not gonna, we're gonna just cover the basics. Here's some nice paintings that we call the gallery pages. Uh, it's anyhow, it's a, it's a fun little, fun little book. Nothing too serious. Oh, this, this kind of makes me sad right on the spot. This is my friend for 40 years, John Siri Lester, who just lost the fight against cancer. Oh well, not getting off the fun part here. Plein air paintings. You know, plein air paintings became, all of a sudden in the 70s and 80s, became real fashionable in the United States. Everybody ran out and started painting outdoors, which when I came here in the 60s, I never seen anybody out with an easel in a park or by a river painting. And I kind of wondered why, because I was so used to it. In Germany, you see it all over the place. People in museums sitting with an easel in front of an old masterpiece and copying it to learn, to learn. So outdoor painting, landscape painting, was not really it discovered here till it became fashionable in the 80s, no, 70s and 80s. Um, when I talked about learning to paint little objects correctly, as a photo retoucher, the client who had you either retouch or illustrate their product they didn't want to see my inter interpretation of it. They wanted to see their product. And so you, I had to learn to paint photographically because we worked, added onto photographs. It better looked like a part of a photograph. So this really, really tight painting is a discipline that I learned and I'm proud about. Yet, here's an example. This. This little guy, if we can zoom in on it, every hair, every eyelash with a real tiny brush. This is with a big fat brush with watercolor and let things run and explode and be, look like a furry, but I didn't paint any hair. So that's the difference between tight and loose paintings. And believe it or not, after all those years doing the photographic tight stuff, I looked at Singer Sargent, I looked at Richard Schmidt, and was just amazed that they could, with a huge brush or with a few brush strokes, make something look like it was a hundred trees. I would have had the tendency to sit down and do a hundred trees. These guys just saw the bigger shape and caught the essence of that subject. And by just indicating it made it work. Some paintings, and we all know that, you are up close and you think, oh my God, what a mess that is. Lumps and strokes and, you know, scratches. And then you back up and all of a sudden it falls together like a beautiful rendered scene. So that fascinated me after the tight stuff. And I tried hard as can be to get to that point where I could not add the highlight and the shadow to every little piece. So when we do this, do this plein air painting now, by the way, we do it every Saturday. We started that group in 2000 and have done it every Saturday since. But if you can go in on those paintings a little bit, uh, two hours, two and a half hours, you just try to catch the essence of that scene. Not every blade 
of grass. And then I come home and I looked at it and I said, yeah, that's, that, it needs something. It needs maybe a great blue heron, which is right down there. Can you see him? He's just as camouflaged as he was when we were there because I saw one there. Often I take my inspiration for adding an animal in the studio uh, from what was really there when we painted there for a few hours. That other one, the big beautiful sky, which is by the way in Canada, was a nice painting. It was done as a demo on a Sunday class I had. In my whole class we all painted the same scene. But when I was done and I looked at it, and it needed the ego. It needs life. It's a pretty scene without it also. But it just adds something when you, you know, put an animal or a human or, or something in there that's life. My Sunday classes, uh, we all normally do at least 16, 20 size paintings and we start in the morning and I demonstrate in front of everybody okay let's do the sky this is how I do it they I said since you signed up for my class you might as well do it like I do it because everybody does it different but you signed up with me so you better do it <laughs> and then when everybody's got the sky done okay let's go to the far shoreline Try to hit the color just soft enough that it looks like it's back there. Again, we're trying to force perspective. And what, the coffee cup? And yeah, the cup's blocking the shot. Oh, the coffee cup is in front of the... Well, it's still Canada, it's still pretty. <laughs> and like I said, I added the eagle. But on that Sunday class, by the time everybody leaves in the afternoon by 4 o'clock, we basically have all the same painting, and they are not at all the same painting. Everybody, it's just like handwriting. You can write the same sentence or the same word, and it looks all different. It depends on personality. And One example that I read somewhere was, or saw somewhere was, we take a little kid, and have them write their name on a big piece of paper. And then there's some that go, Bill, like that. And then there's the girl, little girl next to him, it says Susie. It's personality. And it comes out in painting. Some are real bold with color and bold with brush strokes. Other people are so tentative that I tell them, hey, use a bigger brush, because they kind of feel like if they use a small brush, they can only make a small mistake. Uh-uh. Get at it. You're in charge. Just use a bigger brush, and it's not brain surgery. If it doesn't turn out, wipe it off and do it over, which is, by, by the way, the good part of oil paint compared to acrylics or watercolor. If acrylics dry, you're going to paint over them. You can't wipe them off. Oil stays wet for a couple of days, three days, four days sometimes. And you can correct stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it's, it should be a good intro to get you interested in watching the next live show we're going to do, because it's all about oil painting or watercolor or I touch on touch on all those media because people say what do you paint in only I said anything that makes a mark I see the problem in putting the right color in the right place with the right edges and I don't care if it's watercolor pastel oil acrylics Needlepoint. I don't care. You still got to put the right color in the right place. There are certainly different techniques that you have to get used to and study. The one big example is in oils, we start with the darkest dark, 
to put on the canvas because by then your turpentine, your brushes, nothing has been polluted with lighter color. So you get some real rich darks. Once you get the real rich darks in, you can go on to half tones and lighter areas. And we get into all that when we actually paint on a live show again. Whew. Sometimes I have to look for the guy with the hook to get me off stage because my mouth doesn't shut up. There's, by the way, a funny little thing. Filming 56 episodes of Your Brush with Nature. It's a 30-minute show each episode. And while I'm painting, I have to keep talking because somebody in our crew would say, hey, talk, it's not a silent movie, you know. So I learned to talk all the while I'm painting. And then I go out with my buddies on Saturday and, and paint f just for fun. And pretty soon somebody around me is going to say, would you shut up? <laughs> I got to remember that I'm not on camera. So, all right, thank you so much. It was fun. I had, I really enjoyed it. And thank, thanks to my tech guru here with all the equipment, and he's so good with technical, with all that mechanical and technical stuff. I have no idea. I can use my computer to what I need and not a thing more. So, Jeremy is great at this stuff, and it should look professional. Certainly the equipment is just amazing, amazing to me. We'll see you soon again. Join us on the next episode. Bye-bye.